Good evening, I'm Richard Rellis in tonight for Jose Cardenas. We'll talk about a play based on the life of former Arizona governor and U.S. Ambassador Raul H. Castro. And the book hopes to shed light on the indigenous cultures that originated in the southwestern region. Plus, a program motivating students to complete high school and continue on to complete a college degree. All this tonight on Horizonte. <laughs> Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. American Dreamer, The Life and Times of Raul H. Castro is a play based on the true life story of Raul H. Castro, who came to the U.S. during the Mexican Revolution. He was a farm worker, boxer, judge, teacher, lawyer, U.S. ambassador to three nations, and in the 1970s, he served as Arizona's only ever Hispanic governor. Soon you'll get to be able to see uh, the play based on his life. And joining me to talk about that play is Richard Schultz, director of the play, James Garcia, playwright and actor in the play, and Catherine James, actress who plays Raul Castro's mother and other roles in the performance. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. So much this guy has done in his life. <laughs> how did you start deciding, how do you make so many varied roles into a compact performance. Uh, well, it, in some ways it was easy because he sort of made it easy. I, uh, I met Raul Castro at one of his birthday parties when he was in his early 90s and he opened his mouth at the microphone and he spoke in many ways the way a play should sound. Right? And uh, I, it, I was fortunate that even though I conducted a number of interviews with him and met with him several times as I was working on the piece, he had actually dictated more or less his entire life story and had it transcribed by a secretary at his law office or something along those lines. And that eventually became an, uh, a memoir uh, that's out now. Uh, but that was the material I had to work with, and so it was dialogue that I began with, and that made it, frankly, a lot easier. So he sort of placed things in context where things would matter, because again, he has so many varied roles, governor being the one I guess we know most in Arizona, but yeah, he yeah. had an ambassador, I mean. Yeah, but he, he spoke a lot about his life in the kind of the big picture context in terms of, you know, crossing the border and what it took for him to become governor or become a U.S. ambassador. So he had a lot of stories about his life along the way and the challenges he faced. Now as a playwright, my job was to take those stories and create scenes so, you know, I remind people that this is not a documentary, it's a play, it's a piece of fiction ultimately inspired by a man's true story. Uh, and so that was the fun part for me, but he essentially gave me all of the pieces that I needed. Directing it mm -hmm. with, again, so much time passage, what are the challenges in presenting this? Well, you have a cast of eight playing upwards of 50 roles, and so they're moving quickly through um, 70 years of U.S. history, as well as lo various locations and the different characters, most of them representing the type of um, obstacles that the governor ran into throughout his journey. So they're representing people with very distinct mindsets and attitudes um, toward um, race and issues like that as America through the 20th century. Is it chronological? Do we follow it? It is. Through? It goes from really right before his birth, we learn about his parents. So in the early 19 teens, all the way up into through the Carter administration, through like 1980. So I imagine behind the scenes, there's quick maneuvering of sets, a little makeup, a little powder here and there to well, we, dust we, up the gray hair. We certainly utilize the best of theatrical devices to prompt quick changes. We have characters, actors who walk off stage and within two minutes come back as an entirely different character. So, Catherine, how does that work? Uh, getting in the mindset <laughs> as one of, of the actresses. As, as one of the actresses, how do you get into the mindset so quickly to switch? Um, mostly through the rehearsal process and making sure that I know not just who I am when I'm walking out there, but when I am and where it fits into the whole arc of his life story. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of um, costume helps a lot with getting into character, uh, hair changes and. <laughs> Um, all sorts of fun stuff that, that uh, you know, props, just a multitude of little things. And then when you put that together with all the weeks of rehearsal time, it, it just sort of gels, um, actually kind of makes it easy. There's some aspects of his life that do seem fictional. Had you been, when you read the, the script, did some of it jump out at you? Was this can't be true? The guy couldn't have come from these humble beginnings to this. It, some of it just... It's, it's amazing, the riding the rails and, and boxing in Philadelphia. And I'm thinking, you know, here's this guy with a college degree, 
but he's, he's boxing and he's working in the fields. And then he comes back to Arizona and starts his political career. Yeah, is that a running theme, sort of that, the, the notion that he, here's a guy who earned a degree and then decided the, the society doesn't want me. Uh, American society yeah, no, doesn't want absolutely. me to be I mean, a big theme in his, his life was definitely education. There's a thread all the way through his life. And in fact, into his 90s, and he's still alive, of course, but into his mid-90s, he was still visiting schools and talking to children about the value of education because his life depended on every step he took through the educational process. Uh, but his life was also, uh, you know, think about this, the man crossed during the Mexican Revolution, lived through the 20s, 30s, rural Arizona, uh, 40s, etc. And so he was living in a period of time in which you could still see signs that said, no Mexicans or dogs allowed in my restaurant. Those were the times that he lived through. And yet he became a lawyer. And yet he became a judge. And yet, you know, so he, his, his life is about overcoming, br overcoming brick walls sometimes to get to the next step in his life. I know there was a statewide tour. What was reaction like around the state? It was uh, excellent. I mean, we went from Flagstaff all the way in the north to the south to Nogales, and of course, um, the Castros lived down in that area, so they were the hometown favorite. So when the cast was down there, they were well received. We also were in Tucson and Phoenix previously, but I think what it is is that the title American Dreamer is so apropos because he really represents America in the 20th century, and every obstacle that America was experiencing, you see it in his story. You know, he's a hobo during the Depression, and that reflects what was going on in the yeah, country. Yeah, I think we'll start seeing some of the, some of the pictures from the play. So, it was, mm -hmm. so again, like he, the varied roles you have to depict, oh, yeah. and the audience really reacts to seeing how he looked through time. And this is one of the things I keep reminding people, is that this man has lived almost as long as the state of Arizona has existed. And so when you talk about Arizona history, in many ways you're talking about sort of his life. He's gone through all of those phases. One of the other things, too, that, that I want to mention is that it's called American Dreamer purposely because, in many ways, uh, he was sort of the original dreamer. We talk about young undocumented immigrants who come here and grow up as Americans. He crossed undocumented with, you know, 12 other members of his family and yet managed to achieve all of, this, all of the amazing things that he did, including representing the United States to three other nations. Is there something that you get when dreamers, when young people... Oh, see this I unequivocally. Mean, uh, yeah, I, yeah. When dreamers come to see the show, they see their life uh, through him. I mean, they they realize that that he's replicating so much of what they've, uh, they've experienced. Yeah, the the struggle, the mm -hmm. fight, the yeah. boxing, as we see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, is that the message that that audiences gather from it? Uh, this this fight, the struggle, that 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 this this was done. You can't overcome the obstacles in front of you? Definitely. It speaks to all audiences, regardless of what your own challenges may be, um, be it racial, gender, or otherwise, is that there are obstacles and they can be overcome. But the persistence and the belief in yourself and the belief in the ideals that you feel is strong about is what carried him through and would carry others through. And you get to play some of the key people in his life. D did you get to meet with him? Did you get to talk to them about what people did? How, how did you... How did you put that through, or did you, did you channel your own life and, and I, what those key people did? I actually, um, we had a copy of his autobiography that we were sharing around, and that was really helpful. That was really informative. And then hearing just some of his own stories when we've, <laughs> when we've met with him occasionally, he really, man can tell a story. <laughs> he certainly can. Well, what does he think of the play? Has well, he he's, he's been to it twice, actually, and he enjoys it. He, he hasn't really walked out. Now, he's yeah. a diplomat, though, so, you know, he's been, so, so, but he seems to genuinely enjoy it. Now, the, one, the person that I was sort of fearful of would be his wife, who is extremely blunt and honest about everything, and she loved it. You know, I expected if she didn't like it, we would have heard about it. There would be no diplomacy there, but she actually loved the piece. I talked with him in 2012. We were doing sort of a, at the Republic, a, a centennial series of centennial stories. He seemed surprised that there hadn't been anyone else, that there hadn't been another Latino governor or even another yeah. Latino statewide office holder I, I, since. Yeah, and I think that has a lot to do with his attitude towards it because again and again, he faced obstacles in a period of time when discrimination was really pretty rampant and people would tell him, you can't do this because you are Mexican. Uh, and he basically said, why can't I do it? And his whole life was that way. So I think, yeah, on some levels, he is, he is surprised that there haven't been others. Yeah, and this is the, the third staging of it. What, who is the audience? Who comes to see this play? 
It's, it's truly diverse. I mean, we see, um, we see diehard theater goers that come because it's a story that they're curious about. We certainly see a strong representation of the Hispanic population coming out. Um, our audiences are as diverse as the characters that are represented on the stage. And um, I think it speaks to people for a number of reasons. I, I'm a transplant from the Midwest, and when I learned of his story, I was surprised that he was the only Hispanic governor, something that I assumed there would have occurred more often. And I think people leave with an appreciation of how ahead of the times he really was throughout his life, and in, even in being the first Hispanic governor and so far the only one. What would we see behind the scenes? If we, we could get the behind the scenes documentary. <laughs> Just beyond the wings. The, the behind-the-scenes documentary, people running in all different directions, <laughs> <laughs> clothes costumes flying, flying, costumes flying. Yeah, helping each other put costumes on. Yes, yes. Put, mm -hmm. put costumes on, take costumes off. <laughs> Does anybody know where that book is that I'm supposed to be carrying? Yeah. Who moved my props? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the age range you go through during the, the play? I think when we first meet his mother, she's... She's pretty young, maybe Probably 15, 16, no, she, maybe. Yeah. Early 20s. Yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe 20s. And yeah. then we go all the way up to when she but died. you play her 15. 87. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then characters in between that are all Characters over. in between, you know, Mrs. Mrs. Wright. She plays the, different characters as The well. teacher who yeah. encouraged him, probably, I'm guessing, from her early 20s all the way up into... How old was She's, she? When she he was has a great variety of characters. She plays the mom. She plays a teacher of Raul Castro. She plays an emissary from Lyndon Baines Johnson's <laughs> administration. She plays a whole variety of things that are just recurring. not to mention all the other important American figures that pop up in this. James has, right. has written in um, President Carter, mm -hmm. uh, Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. We see um, Carl Senator Hayden. Hayden. Carl Hayden is you know, so it truly represents a cross country of uh, cross section of Arizona history. He he has an amazing life still going. Yeah. Strong. He's living in California now. Yep, I understand. He's in San Diego, right? But yeah. uh, but we can certainly uh, catch up on his life. American Dreamer, Lifetimes of Raul Castro, March 27, 28, and the matinee on the 29th. Tickets at newcarpet.org. Thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see you, you at the Thank theater. You. Thank you very much. Maíz, meaning corn in Spanish, refers to the indigenous cultures that originated in the southwestern region. Roberto Rodriguez is a University of Arizona professor and author of Our Sacred Maíz, Is Our Mother. Producer Tassandra Solomon, producer Tassandra Solomon, and photographer Eric Rodden sat down with Professor Rodriguez about his book. I've been a writer for 42 years, and as a professor, um, my work as a writer led to the work as, of being a professor. Roberto Rodriguez is a professor of Mexican-American studies at the U of A, along with being a published author. His book, Our Sacred Maíz is Our Mother, is shedding light on a culture that is rich in origin and spirit, especially for those living in the Tucson area. Most people of Mexican descent, Mexican-Americans, Native peoples off in this area, have a history and a culture that literally it goes back many, many thousands of years to this very continent. The Maíz culture refers to the native populations that originated in the southwestern region. Do you eat a tortilla? You know, do you eat chile? Do you eat beans? Do you eat squash? You know, those are foods that are here indigenous to this continent, been here for thousands of years. And, you know, as you know, the sci scientists say you are what you eat. Maíz, meaning corn, is the only crop that needs humans in order to grow. Rodriguez says that by following the Maíz, we are able to follow the indigenous cultures who planted them. Wild grass and Tel Saintly were crossed, and now it came maize. Can't grow by itself. Therefore, there's a relationship between all maize based cultures. You know? Mexican culture of today can trace its heritage back to these indigenous nations of maize, something that Rodriguez has dedicated his life to sharing with others through his writing. In la quesh, esto eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. Um, it teaches kids to see themselves in each other, and it doesn't matter their race, culture language, you know, gender. It's like you see yourself in everyone, you know. Rodriguez says that Mexican-American studies and other classes that highlight indigenous cultures like the maíz are important to teach in classrooms. Why teach it? Teach it because, you know, at the most fundamental, at its most basic level, why shouldn't we know the history of this continent? This is where we're at. Here at Horizonte, we want to hear from you. 
If you have comments, story ideas, or questions, email us at horizonte at asu.edu. Maricopa County Community Colleges run a nationally recognized program called ACE, Achieving a College Education. It has proven successful in motivating underrepresented students to complete high school and continue on to complete a college degree by helping students make a smooth transition between high school, community college, and university. Joining me to talk about the program is Linda Maison Gutierrez, President and CEO for the Hispanic Women's Corporation, and Stella Torres, Director of the Maricopa County of the Maricopa ACE programs for the Maricopa County Community Colleges District. Thanks for joining us this evening. Good evening. Thank you. Let's talk about college. Uh, there's, a, there's some criteria here that you find students, is it easy to get students to sign up for this program? Do they, is the first hurdle convincing them that college is something that could be done? Oh yes, I mean we have 28 years of um, doing this with this program and uh, currently we take a thousand students a year throughout the ten colleges, but unfortunately, we're turning a thousand away that we don't have the funds to get in. You're so, turning a thousand yes, away for yes, lack of funds. Yes. Which we'll get to the dinner uh, <laughs> yes. later. But you're turning a thousand students mm -hmm. away for lack of funds. And what they find is that um, they have a desire and a dream to better themselves and to go to college. And we look at first generation. So they're always like uh, wanting to, they see that they can succeed in college and because we start them early or they want to change their high school life. Maybe, you know, they were not do good students, but then they start taking college and they learn that they can do it. In the 28 years, has that waiting list grown? Are there yes. more? Yes. What was it like early on at the beginnings of this program? Well, in 1987, there was only one college, uh, South Mountain Community College, th where it was started, and then Glendale Community College came in in 1990. And not until 2001 did we go into the other eight colleges. So uh, the need was always there, and um, it got bigger and bigger. And then our own alumni, the students who went through the program, and we have a strong parent component with it. We have parent orientations, parent workshops that we hardly have to recruit sometimes because families and, and uh, cousins and brothers and sisters already know about the program. What attracted you to want to support this program? Um, well, I would say the Hispanic Women's Corporation has always been invested in the education of our youth. And I really do believe that when I was approached by Dr. Rufus Glasper, the Chancellor of the Maricopa Community Colleges, as well as Dr. Steve Helfgott, who's over, who oversees the foundation, and together with uh, Estela Torres, who I've known forever and a day, you see that kind of investment, you see that passion, and what a greater gift to our community than to be involved in a partnership that leads to those goals, an early start toward a college education. You just can't argue with that. It seems intuitive, too. It seems like a, a, a program that just is starting with some, some simple goals, which end up in the result being a college education for somebody. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But as Stella noted earlier, that uh, if you can start to deal with some of the obstacles in that pathway, which could be financial aid, which is the importance of this dinner that's coming up, but also the fact that you want that parental support and you want the support of the community college that the students are attending. Uh, that's absolutely essential to achieving the end-all goal to walking out with college credits and making a smooth transition to the university. Yeah, and that smooth transition, it seems like one of the goals of the program is to make it seamless that what you're doing in high school you just keep going and mm -hmm. do it for a few more years and you end up with a college exactly. degree. Exactly. It's a concurrent program and that means that they go to high school five days a week and then they come to the college campuses on Saturdays for a class and in the summers. So they're, they can earn uh, 12 credits a year and we, they come into the program uh, through the junior and senior year and um, so they kind of like, the credits are there for the community college and they could earn 24 credits. How long is the day on Saturday? Are they there as a school it's day? It's like a night class, three hours. Like if you remember when we went to Arizona State or, or um, to 
Phoenix College, you took a, a class and it was three hours, a night class or something. We do it on Saturday mornings. So it doesn't ruin their whole weekend? No, it doesn't. And is that is that something for them to even just step foot on that campus? Yes, exactly. To how it feels, to use the libraries, to use the tutoring services, to find out about financial aid. And then we do a summer session also. Every summer they come for the first summer session, five weeks. Is there something in the way you developed the program or something in the way when you heard about it that resonated with you? personally of this is something that I went through because I understand the challenges of, of going through this. Absolutely. I consider myself to be first generation, uh, at having attended college in my family. And when you take a look at that, I, you're, it's, it's a hit and miss proposition. It just absolutely is. And you're going in, quite frankly, without all the guidance and the knowledge that you could have had or should have had regarding financial aid, regarding college success skills. And, uh, you know, you get in there and you do your best and you can just imagine, at least going back with me a couple of centuries, that uh, there was you couldn't go online to go register. There were right. long lines and your prerequisite courses, chances of being closed and... If you went to a big university like Arizona State, oh, absolutely. you might feel swallowed up. Yeah, you know, but I mean, it was still bad enough at a community college, yeah. you know, when you didn't know your way around, but you figured it out and, uh, you, you know, you go back to those experiences and then you hope, okay, all right, so how do I help the next generation feel better about things? How do we smooth that transition over? Uh, how do they see a light at the end of the tunnel without that frustration, if you will? Yeah, there's something, again, very intuitive about it where you just think, even knowing where the library is, where do I park my car, where is that building? Exactly. It just makes that first actual year of college, yes. university or community college, much less stressful? Yes. I mean, I was first generation also, and I come from a mining town, Hayden, Arizona. And uh, I was, I came to Arizona State, and I tried to be a nurse at Arizona State, but, uh, you know, bad advisement, da-da-da, so that's why this program just, when um, Nancy Jordan and Liz Warren designed the program for the, for South Mountain Community College in Maricopa, it was just like, Ooh, this is what I wish I had had. Yeah, and then it seems like once that, you mentioned sort of alumni coming back and family members. Once that first generation is mm -hmm. through, it seems just, mm -hmm. it's an expectation that others kind of follow easily? Yes, I think it, there's that empowerment, you know, and um, one of the things I've never been able to track is what we call the snowball effect of how many brothers and sisters, how many aunts and uncles, how many boyfriends and girlfriends, how many parents we helped along the way that were not in the program, but we also show them what Maricopa Community College is about and some of the, the things you need to know about college. And, and so that's something I've never been able to track that I wonder how many we touched. You mentioned working on the parents. Is that something that is a challenge? Was it more of a challenge in years past than it is now? Getting the parents to sort of buy into what their students will be experiencing over the next few years. Well, yes, 28 years ago when I was the first director at the one at South, um, I still ran into parents that had a hard time of understanding education for their children. Pa qué? Uh, because yeah. it, it was their first generation. Nobody really mm -hmm. had ever gone through it. And so I remember having to have uh, parents with fathers, especially fathers, would come to the campus looking for me and I would have to have coffee with them, you know, and meet with them that this is where your, your daughter, your, your son will be here on Saturdays or in the summer. And, and um, now it's a waiting list. <laughs> <laughs> but you let them know it's the long game that you're exactly, saying. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's the education is simply the key to a safety net for their future, for their economic future as well. Yeah. Uh, and there's all the other criteria you talk about. Uh, you try to reach out to first generation uh, kids in single parent homes, people with economic factors. Do most of the students meet one or more of these? They have to meet at least two of those. Okay. And again, there's, there's 2,000 who apply, 1,000 who make it. Uh, I imagine if you had more money, you could get more scholarships to the children on the waiting list. Yes. And which gets us to the Heroes of Education recognition dinner. Uh, this year honoring someone named Linda Mason Gut Oh, that's Linda me. Mason Gutierrez <laughs> from the Hispanic Women's Corporation. When's the event? Are there still seats available? And can people just donate money if they wish? Yes, and it's <laughs> April 16th. April 16th at? 
It's going to be at the Sheridan Hotel Thursday, April the 16th. And uh, everything begins at you know, 5.30, the social hour, and then 6.30, the dinner. So right here at the Phoenix Sheridan Hotel. Excellent. And if people want more information, mccdf.org, which I imagine, whether they want dinner tickets or not, as they're looking for nonprofit donations, want to give money to a, a worthy cause, this is certainly somewhere they could go. Absolutely. Yes. And as a first-generation college student myself, go ASU, and my niece, uh, the story goes as a little girl drove by ASU and said, that's where my Nino goes. I'm going to go there. So, <laughs> good. <laughs> yes, this is excellent. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and, and telling us about this great program. Absolutely. Thank and thank, thank, you. thank you for joining us. That's our show for tonight. For all of us here at 8 and Horizonte, thank you for watching. I'm Richard Rellison for Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.